First of all, I'd like to begin by saying that my utilization of the phrase, the pachyderm and his family, is unrelated to a political connotation. <laughs> I am simply attempting to communicate that when discussing K-12 public education reform and its implications on education policy decisions, there are elephants in the room that need to be discussed. My purpose today is not to provide you direct answers or final arguments for or against the effectiveness of the K-12 public education system or the suitability of the K-12 national education reform. My purpose today is to highlight the reality of the pachyderm and his family in the context of education reform with hope that you might form your own educated opinion on the matter. I believe it is absolutely critical to the future success of our nation that each citizen question and verify information, that each citizen not draw upon political fodder or journalistic hype as they draw their conclusions. I believe that each citizen should be equipped to participate in factual dialogue and then with committed intent formulate their own educated opinion on the status of K-12 public education in our country. At a time when our digital universe is expected to double every 18 months, no one should blindly accept what he or she reads or hears without engaging in strategic discernment. My goal is to provide you with objective information with hope to promote your thinking today and bring you to a deeper understanding of America's public education system. On July 26, 2012, at 11.20 a.m., I received an email from a highly respected Sioux Falls business person, someone I highly respect and lead to, lean to for direction. By the time I finished the opening sentences, I knew that if I didn't take time and put effort into bringing fact forward, I would be contributing to the continued perceived failure of America's K-12 public education system. This email represents a national reform agenda that for the most part has gone unquestioned. And today, this email provides me an avenue from which to lead the pachyderms out of the room and into the public forum. Sent to various business leaders, including me, state officials, both elected and appointed, the message read, it's so unfortunate that Michelle has to say what she says below, but nonetheless, it's very true. It really sucks for America. Let's all get in the same groove and aggressively, persistently do something about this so that the American light doesn't further dim. With alarming interest, I read on to learn that Michelle was Michelle Ree, founder and CEO of Students First. She was chancellor of the Washington, D.C. public schools from 2007 until 2010. In 2010, she founded Students First, a nonprofit tax-exempt political advocacy organization which works on education reform issues. Her message, and I quote, as Team USA gears up for the 2012 Summer Olympic Games in London, we expect great things from the athletes and teams representing our country on the world stage. We'll all be proud of the successes they'll have. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for our education system. The U.S. education system should be best in the world, but when put in the spotlight, we fumble. While 24 countries race ahead of us in the global rankings, the U.S. education system remains far behind, out of shape and out of breath. How would U.S. education do in a matchup against the rest of the world? Watch the new Students First video to find out. End of quote. So I watched the video. Well, now we're going to really see if the U.S. can keep up with the rest of the world. I like
like his approach, but he doesn't seem to have any idea of how to get over that hurt. It looks like he's just dancing around the problem. And now it looks like he's just going to wing it. Oh! That's going to leave a mark. The sad truth? This is our education system, and it can't compete with the rest of the world. We need reform now. To see what you can do, go to studentsfirst.org slash olympics. Prior to receiving the email, I was well aware of the national reform agenda, and the bipartisan call to action can best be summarized by this quote found in current campaign literature. Despite spending more on public education than virtually every other nation, our students' math and science achievement lags well behind that of their peers abroad. One in four American students fails to graduate from high school within four years as of entering. And far too many of those who do graduate are ill-prepared for the demands of college and career. The National Education Agenda's solutions to the perceived problem contain performance pay incentives and ultimate imposition of replacing principals, replacing staff, converting and reopening schools under new management, or closing schools and sending children to higher performing schools. However, prior to receiving this email, I had allowed myself to believe that Michelle Rhee's message and the public acceptance of her portrayal of America's public education system was not my immediate problem. As superintendent of the Sioux Falls Public Schools, I consume myself with leading 3,000 employees in a relentless quest to see that each one of our 24,000 students are fully educated and prepared to succeed in this changing world. Prior to receiving the email, I believed I was too busy. And besides, I had faith that reason would prevail. And the public, certainly South Dakotans, would eventually recognize that replacing a principal, non-renewing teachers, or paying them differential rates of pay would not eliminate the pachyderms in the room. The fact that the email landed in my inbox in July became my wake-up call. Rather than delete, I reflected. Now going back to Michelle Rhee's comparison in the video, I believe the rosters of the Olympic competition are filled with world-class athletes, and I do not believe Olympians are selected randomly for participation, nor assigned to participate by age and placed in categorical classifications for athletic competition. I am not aware they re are required to compete against their peers, regardless of their natural or developed ability. And I have never heard they are merely appointed to participate in an event based upon the number of years in attendance at training camp. As I sat at my desk, struggling, searching, seeking to outline the monumental task before me, I vividly recalled the voice of Jamie Vollmer, a highly successful business person and attorney in this country, tell me his story just a few weeks prior, and he said, I stood before an auditorium filled with outraged teachers who were becoming angrier by the minute. My speech had entirely consumed their precious 90 minutes of in-service. Their initial icy glares had turned to restless agitation. You could cut their hostility with a knife. I represented a group of business people dedicated to improving public schools. I was an executive at an ice cream company that had become famous in the middle 1980s when People magazine chose our blueberry as the best ice cream in America. I was convinced of two things. First, public schools needed to change. They were archaic selecting and sorting mechanisms designed for the industrial age and out of step with the needs of our emerging knowledge-based society. Second, educators were a major part of the problem. They resisted change, hunkered down in their feathered nests, protected by tenure and shielded by a bureaucratic monopoly. They needed to look to business. We knew how to produce quality zero defects, total quality management, continuous improvement. In retrospect, my speech was perfectly balanced, equal parts ignorance and arrogance. As soon as I finished, a woman's hand shot up. She appeared polite, pleasant. 
She was, in fact, a razor-edged veteran high school English teacher who'd been waiting to unload. She began quietly. We're told, sir, that you manage a company that makes good ice cream. Best ice cream in America, I smugly replied. How nice, she said. Is it rich and smooth? Sixteen percent butterfat. Does it have premium ingredients? Super premium. Nothing but triple A. I was on a roll. I never saw the next line coming. Mr. Vollmer, she said, leaning forward with a wicked eyebrow raised to the sky, when you are standing on your receiving dock and you see an inferior shipment of blueberries arrive, what do you do? In the silence of that room, you could hear the trap snap. I knew I was dead meat, but I wasn't going to lie. I send them back. She jumped to her feet. That's right, she barked. And we can never send back our blueberries. We take them big, small, rich, poor, gifted, exceptional, abused, frightened, confident, homeless, rude, and brilliant. We take them with ADHD, junior rheumatoid arthritis, English is their second language. We take them all, every one, and that, Mr. Vollmer, is why it's not a business, it's school. The outline of accomplishing my monumental task became clearer to me. And beginning with poverty, I knew that I needed to lead the pachyderm and his family out of the room and into the public forum. The Program for International Student Assessment, commonly known as PISA, is a system of international assessments that focuses on 15-year-olds' capabilities in reading literacy, math literacy, and science literacy. PISA emphasizes functional skills that the 15-year-olds should acquire as they near the end of their compulsory schooling. PISA is coordinated by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, an intergovernment mental organization of industrialized countries. Begun in 2000, PISA is administered every three years. So on the 2009 results, which are the last available until the 2012 results will be released in December of 2013, the United States ranked 17th in reading, 31st in math, and 23rd in science. There were 65 countries participating in the assessment. Many headlines at the time agreed with the opening paragraph of a Washington Post article. It said, after a decade of intensive efforts to improve its schools, the United States posted these results in a new global survey of 15-year-old student achievement, average in reading, average in science, and slightly below average in math. Those middling scores lag significantly behind results from several countries in Europe and Asia. And like Michelle Rhee, many of our national leaders expressed concern and an urgent need for reform. U.S. Representative George Miller, who is chairman of the House Education and Labor Committee, stated, average won't help us regain our global role as a leader in education. Average won't help our students get the jobs of tomorrow. Average is status quo, and it's failing our country. This is clearly an issue the next Congress must address. <coughs> Secretary of Education Arne Duncan responded, For me, it's a massive wake-up call. Have, you, have we ever been satisfied as Americans being average in anything? Is that our aspiration? Our goal should be absolutely to lead the world in education. Now, while most of the education community sat bewildered and speechless at the reaction to the PISA results, Former Assistant Secretary of Elementary and Secondary Education in the U.S. Department of Education, Gerald Tarasi, examined how the U.S. reading scores on the PISA compared with the rest of the world if we overlay it with the impact of poverty. Now across time, researchers have documented time and time again that perhaps the only true linear relationship in the social sciences is a relationship between poverty and student performance. There is no relationship between poverty and ability. 
but the relationship between poverty and achievement is solid and has been shown and documented time and time again. Here in the Sioux Falls School District alone, since 1997, we have ran many multiple regression analysis, and each time, socioeconomic status or poverty surfaces as the key significant predictor of student achievement. So Tarasi determined that a more accurate assessment of the performance of U.S. students would be obtained by comparing the scores of American schools with comparable poverty rates to those of the other countries. Believe it or not, of all the nations participating in the PISA assessment, the published poverty rates in, of all of those countries, the United States has by far the largest number of students living in poverty at 21.7%. The next closest countries were New Zealand at 16.3% and the United Kingdom at 16.2%. When the schools in the United States with less than 10% poverty were compared to the nations with less than 10% poverty, the United States, our public education systems ranked first in the world in achievement. And the next category examined by Tarasi would be the schools with 10 to 24.9% poverty rate compared to similarly situated countries. The U.S. placed first out of the 10 comparable nations. And with the remaining U.S. schools whose poverty rate were at 25% or greater, they far exceeded any other country who participated and provided their poverty statistics. Because we always strive to be the best in this country, rankings on the latest PISA assessment should be of concern to each one of us. However, I ask you today, to reflect upon. Is the problem the ranking of our educational system? Or is the problem the presence of poverty in our schools, in our communities? I ask you today, should our nation, our state, and our local efforts be focused on reforming K-12 public education? Or should it be focused on breaking the cycle of poverty for our children? Having moved the, the poverty pachyderm into the public forum, the next pachyderm to lead forward is the graduation rate. You may find it interesting to learn that Shanghai, China was the top performer on the PISA assessment, and it was not included in Tarasi's analysis for two reasons. One, it's a city, not a country, and two, because 35% of Chinese students ever attend high school. In contrast, in the United States and our public schools, all students attend high school and our schools are held accountable to see that each one of those students graduates within a four-year window of time. In 2005, our nation's governors signed the National Governors Association Graduation Counts Compact. They voluntarily implemented a common formula for calculating their state's graduation rate based upon entering and exiting high school in four years. Students who continue high school beyond that four-year window, beyond their expected graduation four-year timeline, or complete their general education diploma, their GED, are not considered successful in the governor's compact rate and are labeled dropouts. In March 2012, the Los Angeles Times reported a story with the headline, When high school is too much, one in four don't graduate, the report finds. And statements from the article included, the graduation rate rose from 72 to 75 percent, 75 and a half percent in 2009, meaning that roughly one in four of American students dropped out of high school. The number of high schools graduating 60 percent or fewer students on time so-called dropout factories fell from 2007 and 2002 to 1,550 in 2010. Dropout factories 
as defined by the Los Angeles Times as the high schools in our country who fail to have 60% or more of their students graduate within four years, regardless of whether or not the remaining 40% are still enrolled in high school, successfully working toward their high school diploma. Allow me to bring application of this home to South Dakota. Recently, the South Dakota Department of Education released the Sioux Falls School District's graduation rate to be 79.1%. Based on the state's calculated graduation rate, one would assume that 20.9% of our students did not successfully complete high school. That in essence, the Sioux Falls School District was a dropout factory for 349 students. However, the fact is that rather than 20.9%, 8.4% of our students did not graduate. 184 of the 349 so-called dropouts are enrolled in continuing their high school education with us today in this school year, and 25 of them have completed their GED. Because each of these students did not complete high school in the National Governors Association four-year window of time, they are all labeled dropouts. Due to personal challenges, significant disabilities, or even entering high school with limited English proficiency skills, some students simply need more time to graduate. For example, in this group were students born with a disability who had completed every credit required to graduate within four years, and yet they and their parents have to accept an unsigned diploma so that they can continue to receive services between the age of 18 and 21, and the K-12 public system can pay for those services until they reach age 21, at which time the adult services begin to pay for them. Those students are in that group of dropouts. Also amongst those labeled dropouts in this group are students who experience such disruptions to their education that they needed to provide for their families, or students who are experiencing such emotional, social challenges beyond which either anyone in this room will ever experience. And they continue, and they haven't given up their quest to complete high school. They may have or will need to take fewer credits in one semester or another, but they're there every day working at it. Neither they or the system have failed. Others in this group took on part-time or full-time employment while still going to school so they could help meet the basic needs of their families. I am not aware of any learning endeavor in which time is held as a constant variable. For instance, those seeking post-secondary degrees are afforded the respect and the opportunity to complete their degree in virtually an unlimited time frame without ever being labeled a dropout. Going back to Michelle Reese's comparison, I do not believe an Olympic athlete is allowed only four years to succeed or be deemed a failure. How many of you know who Eric Hyden is? And if not, this might help you. He owns the most accomplished individual Winter Olympic record of all time. But the National Governors Association wouldn't recognize that. You see, even though Eric Hyden participated in the 1980 Olympics and received five gold medals, those gold medals would not be recognized because they're beyond the four-year window of time. Let me explain. Four years earlier, in the 1976 Winter Olympics in Innsbruck, Austria, Eric finished seventh place. He had no gold medals. According to the National Governors Association, his eligibility for Olympic success would have expired at the end of four years. 76, 77, 78, 79. As far as it goes for Eric Hyden and his gold medals, he's a dropout. Jamie Vollmer stated, 
Only in the pursuit of a high school diploma do we hold time constant, and woe to the child who fails to move up with his class. His chances of graduating dramatically decline, and if he does graduate, he'll be stigmatized as having been left back for the rest of his life. Numerous statistics and reports from the U.S. Department of Labor indicate the importance of graduating from high school. For example, in 2006, the unemployment rate for the high school dropouts aged 25 and older was one and a half times greater than those with their high school diploma. Data for the same year showed that the median annual income for those with a high school diploma was nearly 32% higher than those who had dropped out. This data makes it very clear the high economic cost of, com of not completing high school. However, it, and we all agree, and no one would argue, it is mission critical that each student graduates from high school. But I ask you today, is it mission critical that they graduate within a four-year window of time or be deemed a failure? According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the status dropout rate measures the percentage of individuals who are not enrolled in high school and do not have a high school diploma. Among all individuals in this group, the status dropout rate has trended downward from 1972 to 2009, from 14.6% to 8.1%. So the fact is, the United States has experienced a 45% decline in dropout rates since 1972. Given this downward trend, given the percentage of students who do complete in the four year, and the percentage of students who don't give up and complete in greater than four years, I ask you, are America's public schools failing to graduate our future? I believe the graduation pachyderm deserves a place in the forum, and standing at the door is the motivation pachyderm. Earlier, I stated that the national education reform calls for solutions that include performance, pay, and ultimate imposition of various turnaround models for education. The national agenda imposes accountability measures that reward success and punish failure. In 1968, Herzberg illustrated that achievement and recognition are the most important factors to motivate employees, and that salary matters only to the degree that the employer does not pay what others are paying in the field. Attempted to be disproved multiple times since 1968, Herzberg's research still holds today. Salary incentives within the organization are not the motivating factor. Given this, I ask, will implementing performance pay improve student achievement? I ask you, will replacing a principal, firing a teacher, converting a school to new management or closing its door eradicate and address the poverty issue in this country? If the national reform agenda is fully implemented, will students born with a disability, benefiting from a transitionary period between the age of 18 and 21, experience eradication of their disability and receive a signed diploma? If a school is converted to new management or its doors closed, will the students who experience significant socially emotional challenges, the challenges they bear each day, will they no longer bear those burdens? And will they be able to stay on course to graduate in the governor's four-year window of time? If teachers receive performance pay, if principals are replaced, if teachers are fired or schools are closed, Will some students working full or part-time to help support the basic needs of their family find financial stability and security? The motivation pachyderm must enter the public forum, and at its heels is the trumpeting call to acknowledge the present 
and to let go of the mythical perceptions of the past. Before I tackle the mythical perceptions of the past, I need to share with you the results of the Gallup poll. Since 1969, Gallup has conducted an annual poll of the public's attitude toward public education. Gallup has consistently found that citizens rate their own schools higher than they rate the nation's schools, and parents with children in school give their schools higher rating than those without children in school. From this, Gallup has concluded that those who know most about the public schools hold a better opinion than those who don't have first-hand knowledge. The Gallup poll explains why, perhaps, across the country, the public's perception of our national, school, national schools are, are somewhat uh, abysmal. But our own data confirms here in Sioux Falls that time and time again, parents rate their own school top-notch, high quality, and they believe there's a problem with every other school. And of course, for the 80% of people who no longer have children in school, their impression, and they reflect back to the day they walked uphill both ways to and from school. <laughs> and I often hear, if schools were only like they were in my day, if they were only like that, we'd have no problems. Regardless of the era, People nostalgically look to the past, to the day they were in education, as the golden era of education. Recall Michelle Rees' assessment of today's educational system, and compare it with this message from the 1983 Education, Our Nation at Risk report. It said, our nation is at risk. Our once unchallenged preeminence in commerce, industry, science, and technological innovation is being overtaken by competitors throughout the world. The educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and a people. Then compare that 1983 Nation at Risk to Admiral Rickover's 1963 book, titled American Education, a, Nat a National Failure. He said, education is not adequately serving us and must be reformed. We have at present no clear-cut educational philosophy, no firm objectives. Scholastic achievements are too low and there's urgent need to set national scholastic standards. Or compare that to 1942 New York Times that reported one in four college freshmen did not know who the president was during the Civil War. And if that's not nostalgic enough, the Ladies Home <laughs> Journal in 1912 reported and simply concluded that schools failed to educate students. That was 1912. Ironically, 100 years later, in 2012, I received the email which said, it's so unfortunate that Michelle has to say what she says below, but nonetheless, it's very true. It really sucks for America. Let's all get in the same groove and aggressively, persistently do something about this so that the American light doesn't further dim. America's light is not dim. Albert Einstein once said, I never teach my pupils. I only provide them the conditions in which they learn. America's schools need each one of us to form our own educated opinion by embracing the reality of the pachyderms of poverty, graduation, motivation, along with a trumpeting call to acknowledge the present and let go of the mythical perceptions of the past. These realities cannot be ignored in the public forum so that together we can provide the conditions in which each one of our students will be fully educated and prepared to succeed in this ever-changing world.